Hey everybody, this is Phil Town. And this is Danielle Town. And welcome to the Invested Podcast. Danielle's coming to you from Zurich, Switzerland today, and I'm coming to you from Las Vegas. I'm in the Four Seasons, enjoying, <laughs> enjoying a little Four Seasons time after finishing a race over at Spring Mountain. Uh, what kind weekend. of race, Dad? Tell everybody about your race. Oh, what kind of race? So exciting. I was racing Were you in running? The Were you Porsche biking? Owners Club. Were you no, I was riding a unicycle? A, <laughs> I was racing a Porsche. And <laughs> I, <laughs> so a little faster. It was a little faster. I'm riding in the uh, Porsche Owners Club, which is uh, a phenomenal club on the West Coast predominantly that is just full of great people. If you're interested in that sort of thing and you're anywhere around the West Coast, you should take a look at it. It's, uh, it's fabulous. Porsche Owners Club, P-O-C. How uh, really many races did you win? I won both of them this weekend, oh! Saturday and Sunday, <laughs> in the GT4 class. Um, they run a lot of different classes. They have GT5, they have Spec Boxsters, they have GT3, 2, 1. Have you ever so, won a race before? No. Oh! This is this my is so first exciting. race I've ever won. <laughs> this is in everything we've done. Nope, I've never won a race. This it's is, awesome. This is quite I'm exciting. so proud of you. Yeah, I got a little faster this time. Yeah. So that was really fun. And I just wonder, it's a wonderful area. They, they're, this racetrack is out in Pahrump. It's called Spring Mountain. It's about an hour from Las Vegas, and it's really beautifully done. They're making a, a beautiful private race course out there. Cool. And then Las Vegas is Las Vegas, right? So <laughs> yeah. we came back in. A bunch of racers came back in last night. And we had a wonderful dinner over at the Wynn. And we're all staying here at the Four Seasons. And it's nice. Four Seasons. And I know you like Four Seasons. Love. I think I mentioned that Danielle, for her fourth or fifth birthday, was that? Let's see. Yeah. Was that you or your sister? That was you. I think for your fifth birthday, you wanted to go to have go stay overnight at the four seasons in in where was that cedar well, there rapids was no there was no four seasons but it was called <laughs> i didn't the know five what the four seasons, seasons was i just <laughs> wanted to go <laughs> to a fancy hotel and i think right. they had something called the five seasons i yeah, think it was I the five that. seasons yes. <laughs> it's not but exactly the four seasons i totally remember that it was so yeah. fancy it was it's the so best cute. you've always liked nice hotels honey yes. i think you get that from me well, then I got to work in the Four Seasons for a year, which was also oh, that's great. Right. And learned that's the right. back side of things. Yeah, very cool concierge in Jackson Hole. That's right. Make awesome. dinner reservations like a pro, because I am one. <laughs> um, so, so what do you th- let's back get to back Berkshire. to our, uh, our Berkshire chat. And I have finally been able to finish watching the whole thing. I'm really glad that I did. And yeah interesting comments so i think we yeah. left off last time kind of right before they talked about estate planning and uh, a guy asked extremely long estate planning question oh he did and um and warren was basically like i think i get the point something about uh, a football and you catch it but you right. dropped it and it's like, yeah it's all um, over the map. and what i liked about their answer was that one, they were all about like communicating with their kids, which I just thought was a really good thing to say to people. And they said, um, I wrote this one down. If you make a mistake, this is the one you won't get to correct. And mm-hmm. I thought that was nice. And, and then, you know, since you're my kid, I thought about this too. And, I, and they were talking about talking over the will. I mean, these guys are way up there. So they obviously have done this a long time ago. But to talk the will over with the with your kids and have them have input on it, and we haven't done that. So yeah. I think we should do it. Well, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, that's what Warren says to do. And um, then what did Charlie say? Remember that? So Warren, then Warren said, Charlie says, write your obituary and then reverse engineer it. And you know, he does say that. I've heard him say that a number of times, and every time I'm like, oh, that's such a good idea, and I still haven't done it. But. Right. Uh, you know, it's in my head yet again. So I have a problem with that. Good I, I, tell you, I tell you, I have a problem with that, but only a small problem. I think it's always a good idea to look out into the future and try to figure things out. I've never been able to do it very much in my life. Um, I find 
if I look at my life, I find that it is a, a sequence of changing careers and, and really going in very different directions over the course of my life. And I don't think I could have ever imagined any of it, actually. I could have imagined that's quite the army. interesting. That so, so what you're, what I hear you saying is that your obituary would focus on your career. Well, it would have. What well, if you I just leave I, your career out of it entirely? Oh, interesting. Well, then you, I was thinking also. I wonder if those guys just mean like, uh, how much money am I going to make in my life, and then I'll go toward that, right? To reverse engineer it. I think that would it's, be. It's whatever so, is important to each person. I doubt that it's about money for them. Well, think about what it is you do. Okay, what do you do or what you have? How, how would you look at it? I don't know. I haven't done it. That's why it's I mean, it's so interesting when you think about it. I, I would think immediately I go to what do I do? And then I could immediately then go to, oh, what, what will I have? So what did I do? What would I have? Who would I be with? I mean, what else? What else could you think know. about? We should do I don't it. Know. It's, it. We should do it. It's kind of interesting. I don't think you can do it, and I think I think you can do it. But I think if you hold on to it, then you become like a person that thinks they want to be a doctor at ten years old, and then they become one and hate it. But that's you know what they want on their obituary because it sounded good, Doctor Town. Uh, I, I mean, it's just like no. I think man. that's taking it a little too seriously. I think it's a little well, more I, like like the Charlie Munger version of a vision board. Like, what are you thinking about? Put it down, solidify it a little bit, find some pictures or write it down and think about like who you want to influence, who you want to be around, you know, what do you want people to say about you when you're gone? Well, I think we should come back to this with another podcast after we think about it a little bit. Maybe we could actually figure something out. But right now, maybe we could figure. I don't something know. Out. I don't. I don't know how I would do it. <laughs> onward. Let's go onward. Onward. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, very good. Um, what What was the next thing that caught your mind? Like. So for me, the one where somebody asked about this professor, Damodaran, who's at NYU or used to be at NYU. I don't know if he still is. And he's a business professor. He's written a bunch of books. Um, he's written. He's written the the kind of the textbook of valuation. He's the valuation right. guy. Yes, that's the one like, Nuno handed to me, and it was yeah. like three inches thick and terrifying. I've gone yes. through it page by page. I really like Damodaran. I think he's super smart, and I think he's the guy you go to, or his students, or someone who's done the work with with that view of how you value a business. If you have to say what the value of any business is in a court of law, that's the book you would use. But I don't have to value every business on the planet. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have to do it that way. Because mm -hmm. if I do it my way, there's lots of businesses I can't value. There's no way I would know enough to put real value on things. So the way they do it is I think at one hand required and necessary and on the other hand, completely not effective in most of what I would look at. So Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. So it's useful for certain purposes and not for others. And I think just being aware of that is a good thing, knowing yeah. the usefulness and the context. Yep. And what this questioner said was something like he saw him on a show or a podcast or something where he said that Apple is 35% of Berkshire's portfolio and that that is far too high and he doesn't support um, right. having such a high concentration of any one company. And Charlie goes, he's out of his mind. <laughs> and, and what he meant was not that the guy like doesn't know anything. He obviously knows a lot. Um, what they meant is that the Berkshire portfolio is not only marketable securities like Apple and other ones. And so, yeah, and also there are they're going back to a very old theme, which is that I, I think Charlie was saying something like, "This is one of the inane things taught at universities." Yeah, is that's that mass the diversification. Part of it. Exactly. Is mandatory. Yeah. It's an insane idea. So, I mean, these guys' idea and, and mine and yours is that you should own things you understand that are good. 
and it's literally insane to think you can own a huge pile of good things. Not because it's literally impossible, but you know, if you had a maybe, you know, some sort of massive robot mind or something, but because you as a human can't know enough about those things to know that they're good. Mm -hmm. You just can't. And so you have to concentrate on a few things you do understand. And Charlie's back to the old theme, man. They've got lots of high IQs, but those high IQs don't know the edge of their ability. In other words, they're so full of hubris that they are going to he says they're gonna they're gonna teach you diversification of your portfolio. Diversification. Diversification. <laughs> right? I appreciated that he said the issue for a lot of people who try to choose companies to uh, invest in is that a lot of this is what he said a lot of people can't tell their best ideas from their worst. That's the problem. Yeah. And he problem. said we make less mistakes in that regard than others, and that's yeah. a blessing. And that's what we should learn here too. And I was like, that's man, what you want yeah, to do. That's the crux of it, isn't it? That like is. I can mm -hmm. have ideas that seem good to me. Mm -hmm. And it's about being able to discern which of those ideas are genuinely top notch, genuinely going to be a good quality investment for a long time and which ideas are not at that level. So it's not that it's necessarily a bad idea, it's just not as good. And how do I make that decision? And I think they are masters at that. And they've taught us that rule, which is what it has informed my entire investing career, which is rule number one is don't lose money. And rule number two is don't forget rule number one. Mm -hmm. And that is the essence. And it's really, I really do think it's hard for a lot of people to, to understand that that is the essence of good investing is to to avoid making big mistakes. Hmm. Because if you, if you get a few things right in your life, you're going to be very rich. So all you gotta do is avoid getting big things wrong, right? And I think that that's really the key. You'll find the numbers work rather well. If you, <laughs> let's say you make no mistakes so you lose no money, um, and you buy 20 companies in your life, and three of them, really do well mm -hmm. you will be very those rich. are really good numbers yeah yeah the numbers yeah. work i agree that should encourage you to go out and learn this stuff you guys then he talked about uh, taiwan and china yeah and well that's what just came to my mind when you said that like rule number one don't lose money this is a prime example of what buffett does when he makes a mistake or what he thinks might be a mistake the right. taiwan semiconductor question so go ahead i mm -hmm. cut you off no go ahead like basically taiwan semiconductor right like yeah people are going like why did you exit what changed with taiwan because semiconductor? it was very short it was just a few months that he owned it which is extremely unusual yeah for berkshire and on that same theme it's not just i mean basically he said well i'd rather have capital in japan than taiwan right now avoiding you know a really focused answer um, but you can read between the lines pretty easily right there when Charlie also said that, you know, putting money in Baba, Alibaba was one of the biggest mistakes he's ever made in his life. Hmm. And um, he didn't say that at this meeting. He said it at his meeting. Uh, oh, OK. I was year. like, man, I missed that one. Nah, but the yeah. essence of it is, is that things have become we, we have. We have politicians and leaders now in the United States and in China who are equally guilty, and this is a quote, equally guilty of being stupid. Hmm. I mean, really laying it out there, equally guilty of being stupid. Um, and they are in a game now of chicken where somebody pushes it too far and doesn't read the other side correctly, you end up with a World War III. Yeah. Um, and he's basically saying these are not two incompatible religions, they're not two incompatible governments, they're not two incompatible economic systems. We can get along, but you can't be stupid. Yeah. And I, I swear, both sides, Warren didn't say it, but I'll say it, the United States, in going, in threatening China that we are going to make Taiwan an independent nation, 
or we are going to battle for their democracy is ludicrous. That That is the equivalent of Russia telling the United States it's going to go to war to make Cuba a communist nation. There is no real difference there. And that is spitting right in China's face. And on the other hand, Chinese leaders are clamping down on everything to do with capitalism uh, to try to really control. They're, they're shutting down all kinds of free speech around China and, and really scaring the markets and scaring the United States for, oh my God, have we got another Hitler rising up here? We have another Stalin happening. Is this guy out to take over the world? What's what's going right? So you exactly. create fear on both sides. I think anything we can say about the U.S., we can say about China. It, they're yep. both pro- provoking the other. They and really are. what Berkshire, what Berkshire, what uh, Munger and Buffett were both preaching was common sense. They were saying, "Both of you have the ability to blow this up. Don't." watch out we have so much to gain from each other yes and both uh cultures are valuable i mean i think charlie munger has so much respect for chinese culture it's extraordinary and obviously massive respect for american culture and so i really respect his view on uh that the two can coexist and not just coexist but have a true symbiotic relationship yeah um, and I think we he's, don't, we he's don't have really to like seen that as being possible. And I, I appreciated that viewpoint because you don't hear that in the news. Yep. I mean, the idea that, that America should force the world into democracy is making lots of people crazy and has for a long time. The idea that, you know, China is going to, you know, push over the border into India or, you know, push into uh, J- Japan and Korea is all of that makes the world crazy. And when you start criticizing other governments and other ways of doing things, because they're not the way you would do them, you're asking for the world to have a war. And we just have to stop. And we've got politicians in the United States on both sides that are hell bent on their little, their political gain from saying inflammatory stuff. And it's just, they, they have to stop or we're gonna end up with a real, real bad mess. And Charlie, or, uh, one of Buffett pointed out Cuba. I, I thought he didn't raise that point for no reason. Cuba, mm-hmm. he said, was, you know, there was mutually assured destruction did, yeah. and we had a very close call with Cuba. Yeah. He said, you can't make a big mistake in this game or particularly now we have more tools of destruction than ever. So yeah, I thought That's that was true. a huge, huge good point. And it, it I, I didn't watch what Charlie did or Warren did. I, I, I moved out of China when I, when the Ukraine war started and I saw what the United States did to Russian investments and I just like, holy criminy, our government will move aggressively to put those, those investments to zero if we get into trouble with, with Taiwan. Mm. So we got out of there. It was just well, really unfortunate. Yeah. There's so much economic interdependence and yet we're in many ways divesting ourselves of ourselves, meaning like American stock owners in general, of Chinese companies. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. So what was, what I took also from the Taiwan Semiconductor answer was Warren essentially said like, well, we, it's still a great company. And he actually talked for a little while about why it was a great company and that they were close to the owners and they'd gone to meet with them and um, you know, was clearly wanting to send the message that it was a, a good. They didn't sell it because they didn't like the company. They just were uncomfortable yeah. with the geopolitical situation. And then Charlie said, "My view is Warren ought to feel comfortable if he wants to put that in the minutes." <laughs> <Right> <laughs> I was on. like, "Ah, oh, I love it so much. Yes, like right we have on. to feel comfortable about our investments." And to my point in our last episode when I was saying, oh, like, I don't believe that they've never made an emotional decision. Okay. To me, that's an emotional decision. It's not irrational, totally rational, but it's based on he had a, this 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 niggling little notion of, I don't know how this is going to go. I can't predict what 10 years is going to be like, and I don't want to be in that business. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was enough. 
even yep. though it was, a, I, so it was there it is. I, let's say according to all the numbers a great investment great company great leaders good moat blah 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 the whole thing still not enough yeah yep you gotta feel good about it yeah then he went on to talk a little bit about buybacks i thought were, were really good that mm. uh that the you know is the question was about uh, our buyback decisions going to be handled by greg from now on um and and warren just made a point he's made many times and that is that buybacks can be either the smartest thing you can do or the dumbest thing you can do mm, yeah. and that doesn't seem to be commonly shared piece of wisdom out that there that is such a good point say that again you're right yeah it can either be the dumbest thing this is talking about a ceo allocating capital yes buying back your stock could be the dumbest thing you do or the smartest thing you do and and they just don't understand that in most boardrooms um and, yeah, I, I, and think I think i think the why. conversation around buybacks is always like it's this zero sum sort of sort of like a buyback oh we bought back our stock and there's never any information like at what price did yeah. you buy the stock like right. hello it's like saying i don't know i sold my car well how much did you sell it for a dollar or what it's worth like right. <laughs> kind of matters right. and of course that's just a just to make everything clear here the dumbest thing you can do is to buy back the stock of your company as a ceo to buy back the stock of your company at a price that's higher than what it's worth. And the smartest thing you can do is to buy back your stock when its price is much less than what it's worth. Mm -hmm. And the, most CEOs just buy back their stock. And what's created from that, for example, when Trump dumped uh, a ton of money into the corporate coffers by cutting their taxes dramatically mm -hmm. back in 2017 or 16, CEOs, instead of hiring employees, instead of building factories, instead of doing things that Trump wanted them to do and the country wanted them to do, they bought back their stock, despite the fact that the stock prices were elevated higher than the, the value of the companies in most of these companies. And that created a political wave led by Elizabeth Warren to put regulations and laws around how you can spend the money and start to regulate commerce from Washington, D.C., which Elizabeth Warren, a former librarian, decides she knows how to do this better than anyone. All right, and it, all right, all right. Let's no, no, leave wait the a politics. second. I want, to, I want to make yeah. a point because yeah, yeah, Buffett, I want to hear came the out, point. Buffett came out not very long ago and, and really said this is imbecilic to put a tax that Biden and Elizabeth Warren are talking about, a 4.5% tax on buying back your stock. Because again, buying back stock can be the dumbest thing or the smartest thing, and you can't regulate that from Washington, D.C. by making it onerous to do it. Yeah. I mean, in all cases, onerous. In other words, Washington, D.C. has decided, at least those Democratic politicians have decided that buying back stock is a bad idea because they have this, this uh, track record of CEOs doing dumb things. And it led to this political movement. Yeah. And Buffett is saying, whoa, hang on. It could be brilliant to buy back your stock. Why would you penalize it? And just like, oh, my God, you, you know, it's that that's just the part of the crazy is Washington, D.C. The stuff. bad actors ruin it for everybody else. Well, and the, yeah, the bad actors and the politicians who are pandering to their base. Well, they're trying to like, respond, you know, they're trying to, they're going, yeah, this, everyone's idiotic crap, as everybody. you know, so what do we do? Can we do something about it? And they come up with a solution that doesn't solve anything. That's because they're so stupid. They don't bother <laughs> oh, to find out about but... it. Don't you think that's stupid when you, when you start to force people to do things that you don't even understand? I, that, what else would you call it? It's either stupid or it's insane. I don't know which you want to, I don't think well, these people are insane. In similar vein, Buffett also talked about the recent bank failures and the implication, I suppose you could say, that now all of a sudden, all of our bank deposits seem to be insured by the FDIC, even though that's not actual law, but that's right. what they've done. And he was saying that that was, you know, if that's what they're going to do, um, 
he didn't really complain about them doing that exactly, but he was saying, let's just make it explicit, make it clear. Don't leave people in limbo wondering if you're going to do that again the next time. And, you know, here we go again with the regulations and versus like what people actually do. And it's, it's hard to put that into a codified law a lot of the time. In addition, I think those laws, or those, not laws, those sort of swooping in, saving the day so that there isn't a giant bank failure and runs on the banks, has the unintended consequence of insulating the people who actually cause that to happen, of actually making the decisions that led the bank to fail, or that, or the people, Buffett pointed out, the people that borrowed huge amounts of money with no collateral, no personal, uh, what is it? Non-recourse, um, where they don't, they don't have any personal liability and they just basically like expect to be able to roll the loan over. And then when the bank can't roll the loan over, they complain. And he was going like, this is insane. They should not expect anything. They're taking the risk. They have to suffer the consequences. And the people who make the decisions in the banks are making the decisions. They have to take the consequences. And yet we keep seeing over and over, they don't. And he was really calling that out. I thought that probably nobody will pay any attention, but at least somebody with some power is talking about that. I'm not not sure I fully understand his point because... I mean, if you think about it, the people who had made the mistakes on these banks are completely fired. I mean, they're fired. They're gone. And the shareholders who made the mistake of owning those banks are bankrupt. Yeah. They're gone. That was so, his point, is that the it shouldn't uh, just be like, oh, you're fired. <laughs> Like, didn't Munger or somebody say something like, yeah, you don't work there anymore, but you still have you the keys to the country millions. club and you walk away That's with true. millions and you're true. accepted at the restaurants and like nothing changes for you except yeah. that oh you have this little blip yeah when other people's lives are ruined that's true very very true i and i somebody made the point was it was it in this meeting where you should go back four or five years and claw back all their money that, I don't think they said that, but that's a, I agree with that. Right. I, yeah. I think these guys were like, oh, these guys should go to jail. I mean, they're, they're, they're taking risk with people's money who are hiring them to not take risk with their money. I mean, banks are right. supposed to be safe. Right. And in pursuit of bigger and bigger profits, they just keep doing these clever yeah. things. Yeah. So I. And I, did you I notice that, that Charlie totally picked up on my point? He probably listens to our podcast. He totally picked up on my point <laughs> <laughs> that banks that are publicly traded have competing interests, have have the wrong incentives for what they actually do, which is to provide good loans to people who have a strong possibility of paying them back, right. and they do not have the incentive to make those good sturdy financial decisions anymore they have the much more short-term incentive to just pass out loan after loan after loan collect their bonus check and go off to the country club yeah absolutely right 100 percent. all right moving on um somebody was talking about oh should be worried about berkshire and you know if you after you, you guys move on pass away and yeah, Buffett was saying Greg a is fabulous and he will be fabulous with this. And his successor, you know, I leave that up to Greg. Um, something that you need to understand about business, and I thought this was the key point, is that finding great management is, is not simple. It's not mm-hmm. obvious. You don't just have a big bench of wonderful, fabulous people who are going to come up and run this company the way many corporations pretend that they do. And just the fact that somebody has had a career and went to Harvard doesn't mean they're going to be someone who is a great manager. Therefore, we should all follow Tom Murphy's rule. Tom is a fabulous businessman and a, a real Buffett really admires his career. He said, Tom Murphy said, the secret to a good business is to buy a really good business. That's the secret. <laughs> Don't, he said, the the problem is 
that a lot of businesses are not a really good business. And when they're not a really good business, you need really brilliant managers. That's true. And there are just not that many brilliant managers around. And so That's Warren and Barton, Charlie have said this for a long time, and I thought it was clever that they said it again here, that you really want a business that's simple enough that an idiot can run it because someday an idiot will yeah. and you want the business to survive that bad management so the idea that we're going to be able to go and judge that you know these people are wonderful business managers and so fabulous and are going to make this thing great that is beyond the scope of even warren and charlie they they very much prefer to own businesses that are simple a fantastic franchise that is durable, has a big moat, and can handle bad management. Although they want great managers, no question about it. I mean, that's it. the thing is when you when somebody says we want a business that can survive a terrible manager, there's no doing well in that sentence. There's no growing the business. There's no success. It's just pure don't go bankrupt. And right, that's not good it's not good <laughs> like uh, that's a good that's point. where the good managers come in is they take it from survival and move it up to excellent returns yeah absolutely so it is very important but i i think you know he was making the point don't get overly hung up on these worries after work on i don't know though how do you feel about that i i, I get the worries you know um I know Greg Abel is running most things now, and he's doing a great job, but it's going to be different. So It's going to be different, but I'll tell you what, honestly, if Berkshire, if, if, a, if Buffett passes away um, in the next year or two, and the market responds to that by dropping Berkshire's price dramatically, I'm a buyer. Well, and the, the reason... Is- is everybody because you talk the, to says, oh, as soon as Buffett dies, I'm going to buy Berkshire because everybody else is going to sell. I know. It's, it's kind of true. It's like, but it's, they I might think be the right. price is going to pop. No, they might be right uh, because there are a lot of large pension funds that own Berkshire and they are very risk averse they, and they're not going to know. They, they don't dig deep into businesses. They own hundreds of them and they're going to just get out. Maybe. And so I think, yeah. I think they're very likely could be both. They're right the market will drop. But here's the thing. The the company broken up is worth vastly more than we'd pay for it right now. So mm-hmm. uh, if it drops a lot, there's just such a big margin of safety there that it's, it's you know, it's, it's a buy. Yeah. I that's think we what should, think we should too. stop here. Yeah. Actually. And, uh, and let's I think we got one more. I mean, really we sort of covered the first half of the meeting. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think we've like covered, Berkshire pretty much, except that I have some questions about some stuff they said right at the end about the currency in circulation and about, um, oh, what was the other thing? The mark to market of their equities. Mm-hmm. How the accounting Like the going. accounting of it. So my question, like I kind of want to, it's a little less about the Berkshire meeting, a little more just like, let's, I'd like to learn about like the background of these numbers that they look at because I would like to look at them for my own investing. So um, a little more like macroeconomic look. And we could talk about why Elon Musk is overrated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or not. All right. We'll talk to you guys next time. Time That's to go play. Click baby. Okay. <laughs> See Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. Hi guys, thanks for listening to Invested. If you enjoyed this episode and you want more information or to listen to additional episodes, visit our website at investedpodcast.com and sign up for my virtual workshop right there. Spots are definitely limited for this event. I'm not kidding, they really are. They sell out very quickly. So everything discussed on this podcast, by the way, is either my opinion or it's Danielle's opinion. And it's really important, it's not to be taken as investing advice because I am not your financial advisor nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. So remember that. You're on your own here. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I really hope you enjoyed it.